got done watching, or rather re-watching, the classic epic 1962 film, Lawrence of Arabia. Now, th this is actually the third time I've watched this movie, but the first time I've reviewed it. First time I watched this movie, I was a teenager. I, I don't remember the exact year, 14, 15, something like that. Uh, so it was before I was in the habit of reviewing every movie I saw on my blog. It was before I even had a blog. It was before the modern internet as we know it. So no, no review from that watching. The next time I saw this, I was about 30. And at that point, I did have my blog up and running, and I had a practice of reviewing every new movie I saw. New meaning new to me. So the, the first time I saw a movie, I would make it a practice to write a review on my blog. But at that time, uh, movies that I was re-watching, I didn't review. Uh, so because uh, Lawrence of Arabia I had seen before in my teens, I didn't review it when I saw it when I was 30. But now that I've got this YouTube channel and the blog up and running, I, I make it a habit to review everything I watch. Uh, first time watching, re-watching, I, I just turn on the camera and give my thoughts on it. So here we are. So like I said, this is my third time watching this movie. I, I've already seen it twice before, but uh, there have been a couple books on my reading list which have reminded me of this movie and have made me been wanting to give it a rewatch for about a year and a half now. Uh, those two books are The Odyssey and Dune, both of which I read last year. So let's start with The Odyssey. Uh, the Odyssey is by Homer, but this uh, version here, which I picked up at my local bookstore, turns out is translated by T.E. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. So I, I had no idea that he also did a translation of The Odyssey, which is still being sold in bookstores now, but he did. Uh, I, I read it last year. I found his translation very readable. It's a, it's a prose translation, as maybe you can see here. Uh, and it uh, got me thinking, uh, yeah, interesting guy, that Lawrence of Arabia. I mean, who know, Who knew, in addition to being a messianic figure in the Middle East, uh, he also found time to translate the Odyssey. So um, I, that got me thinking about uh, Lawrence of Arabia a bit. And then the other book which I read last year was Dune. So if you know Dune or you know the history of Dune, you know that it was partly inspired by Lawrence of Arabia. I I'm, think maybe the Lawrence's book, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, maybe more so than the movie, or though I don't know. Th this book came out in the mid-60s. Uh, so only a couple years after uh, the, the Lawrence of Arabia film, a few years after. Um, so uh, it, it, it's, Dune is inspired by a number of things, but uh, it's, among other influences, it's heavily inspired by Lawrence of Arabia, both in terms of the desert setting of this film, uh, uh, this book, which would later become a film, sorry. Uh, the desert setting of this book, where, where we get like a majestic uh, description of the grand, epic, beautiful desert, uh, which I, I think is, is uh, very much inspired by the, the loving camera shots that Lawrence of Arabia gave to all those desert scenes. But also uh, the plot of Dune, where we have an outsider who comes upon uh, a tribe which is heavily inspired by Muslim iconography. Uh, the outsider comes uh, to the tribe and ends up becoming uh, their mystical messiah, even though he's an outsider. Uh, so I, again, very influenced by the plot of Lawrence of Arabia, uh, both the man and the movie. So I, I've been meaning to rewatch it for some time. Uh, and uh, because I'm out here in Vietnam and because I don't really have access to any streaming services or DVD shops or anything like that, uh, I had somewhat resigned myself to the fact that it could be a while before I track this movie down. But uh, this past week, or this week, my uh, wife and kids are taking an extended Tet holiday up at the uh, my wife's parents' place, uh, which means I've got some time to search YouTube for uh, old movies that are on YouTube, uh, which, which is where I watch most of my movies nowadays. 
and I was scrolling through a list of old movies that are on YouTube and was surprised to find this movie on here. Um, there, there are a few copies of this movie on YouTube, good quality copies. Uh, and I was like, why haven't these been taken down yet? Because, you know, it's unusual to find. And I searched, is Lawrence of Arabia in the public domain? And I, it's a little bit hard to tell. Uh, Wikipedia said, uh, when it's using the image of Lawrence of Arabia, it says this image is the, in the public domain because it was published between 1929 and 1963 and the copyright was not renewed. I'm not sure if that expands to the movie or not. Uh, I think Google Answers implies that the movie is in the public domain, but I can't find that any, anywhere on the Wikipedia page. Uh, given the fact that there are multiple good copies on YouTube, at the very least we can say that the copyright holders are not overly concerned about it, right? Because if they were overly concerned about it, it would, it would be taken down. Um, yeah, you, you know, why some stuff is available on YouTube and why some stuff isn't is perpetually a mystery to me. And I'm not gonna, we'll, 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 we'll save that rabbit hole for another day. Suffice it to say, there are a few good copies on YouTube. I, I don't know how long they'll stay up, but I will link to the one I watched in the description down below. Now, uh, I, I do have a smart TV in this apartment that I'm renting. So I was able to watch this from the living room couch on the big screen in comfort. And it's, uh, it's a really decent copy, actually. Uh, there are some scenes uh, at the desert at night where it looks a little bit pixelated, some of the sand blowing across the screen. But all the scenes during the daytime look great, uh, a high quality, uh, couldn't tell the difference between this and the DVD version, um, mostly. So if, if you are looking for a good but maybe long movie to watch for free off of YouTube, you ch check this one out. I'll, I'll link to it in the description down below. So uh, I'm going to back up a little bit and maybe give my history with this film uh, because that's going to maybe in inform a little bit of, of what I'm com how I'm coming to it now. I I've mentioned before that I've seen it twice before, but in a, a little bit more detail. Uh, I remember when I was younger that this film was uh, talked a lot about a lot. Uh, I, I think um, back back when I was young, these films from the 1960s maybe because they were closer in time to the 1990s were um, more reminisced about, more talked about. Uh, I seem to remember the scene where Lawrence of Arabia uh, blows up the train track and derails the train was shown um, at electronic stores when, when, you know, when they've got a clip uh, that they're showing to show off how good the definition of their TV is or how good the picture on their TV is. This is one of those clips which would frequently be on there. Uh, I would also see clips of, you know, the, the Lawrence of Arabia racing across the desert, giving his battle cry, raising his rifle. Uh, and then uh, AMC, which back in the 90s used to show uh, genuine classic movies, um, was showing this one month and they were running a number of commercials for it and I was super hyped. I, I knew this was going to be a, a big classic movie. Uh, the trailers for it showed all the exciting spot, uh, all the exciting um, scenes in the movie, all the big battle scenes, uh, all the explosions and I thought this is going to be the best movie ever. Uh, and so one weekend night, one Saturday or Friday night, it was on TV. I watched it in my, uh, the basement of my parents' house and was so bored <laughs> the whole time. I had no idea what I was getting into. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the danger with these classic old films is you, you can make them look really high adrenaline. adrenaline by just uh, showing the most climatic scenes. But then you leave out that this is a four hour movie in which there is a lot of stuff happening in between those battle scenes. A lot of talking, or even worse, a, a lot of not talking. So I, I, I did actually make it through the whole movie somehow. Um, 
But, uh, you know, I, I wanted I wanted to see why everyone said it was such an epic movie, so I sat through the whole thing, but... <clears throat> came away from it quite bored. Now, uh, when I saw it again in thir at the age of 30, I was much more interested in the history of the time period then. I had developed an interest in um, the history of the British Empire. And this is definitely a chapter in the territorial expansion of the British Empire, how the British Empire got into the Middle East and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, I, I didn't really know a ton about it, but I was interested in it. So the, uh, the politicking scenes uh, where they're talking about the future of the Middle East and they're sitting around at the conference table. The stuff that had so bored me at 14 or 15, uh, this time I actually found interesting. Uh, now, there are a lot of slow scenes in Lawrence of Arabia where they're crossing the desert and the majestic music is playing, but there's no dialogue. But I, I was able to put up with those a lot better at the age of 30, uh, because partly because I was older, Partly because I knew what to expect, uh, and expectations are the key, aren't they? If you go into a movie expecting it to be fast-paced, and, and then end up with a very slow-paced movie, that, that you're going to be frustrated. But if you go in expecting it to be slow-paced and said, okay, I'm just going to enjoy the atmosphere of it, I'm just going to enjoy the, the slow pace of this movie, uh, and I was perhaps at 30 uh, a, a little bit more in the film bro mindset where I was like, yeah, this is a classic movie. Look how great this music is. Look how great the cinematography is. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, and now here I am again. Now, uh, if, if you do the math on this, looks like I, I've... Um, seeing this movie once, about once every 15 years. So once in my teenage years, once when I'm 30, and then here once again in my mid 40s. And I think once every 15 years is about all I can handle. Uh, I, 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 I enjoyed rewatching this movie again, but I also came out of it a little bit exhausted. Like, oh, that was a long movie. And there was a lot of stretches where there was no dialogue or things were happening very slowly. I, you know, I, I, I'm glad I rewatched it, but it, um, a, a movie like this, I, I could wait. I could wait another 15 years before watching it again. Um, so this movie goes squarely down in the category of uh, older movies have uh, longer attention spans. Uh, they, they just assumed an audience with longer attention spans. I, I know that's not true with all old movies. Uh, just earlier this week, I, I re reviewed an old movie, His Girl Friday, which, uh, which was an old movie but moved at a very fast pace. But there, there are also old movies which move at a slow pace, and this is one of them. I guess, you know, the good news is if you're worried about your attention span being destroyed by uh, the internet and scrolling and TikTok, etc., uh, then this is a movie you can watch to try and rebalance your attention span. Just, just put this on and uh, this will remind you of what it's like to concentrate on something very slow moving for three hours and 47 minutes. Uh, I mean, it starts out, uh, the, the, the copy uh, I watched on YouTube, which I think I vaguely remember this from when I rented the DVDs uh, at 30, starts off with uh, a blank dark screen and just the orchestra. Uh, what, what do they call that again? The, the overture uh, at, at the beginning of the movie, which goes on for, I, I think, about four minutes of just nothing but music. And I'm like, well, you know, at first I'm like, oh, cool, classic movie, an overture at the beginning. But by about the three minute mark, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, you know, <laughs> the, 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 I'm, I'm not getting any younger here. This is, this is time 
uh, which uh, I'm not quite sure am I meant to be just sitting here staring at the screen waiting for the movie to begin and and of, of course you know you could skip it you could skip it um, but I, I didn't I didn't skip any of it I, I didn't uh, I watched the whole thing um, and uh, it was interesting watching this movie and at one point, uh, I, I'm in my apartment and, and uh, my sister-in-law comes home from work and she's getting dinner for ready for herself while the movie's going on. And I don't know, maybe because there was somebody else going on in the in the room who, who didn't wasn't familiar with this movie. I, I began to think to myself, I, I wonder what she's thinking of this movie I'm watching. And um, I began to notice how long we go with stretches without dialogue. Uh, so that they, they'd be crossing the desert uh, and there'd just be these long, long stretches without dialogue. Um, so there, there's one scene, they're crossing the desert and they, somewhere along the line, they, they notice that one of their party has fallen off their cam his camel and gotten left behind somewhere back in the desert. And uh, Lawrence of Arabia decides he's going to go back for this man. His friends tell him he's uh, insane and that he's never going to make it. But but Lawrence decides to go back anyways. And I, I, I was thinking, okay, in a modern movie, <clears throat> we'd have that set up. And then we'd just maybe cut to him finding the guy. And then maybe cut to him bringing back the guy. We don't need to see the, the journey here. But no, we... we Go to a clip of the the guy walking in the sun. We go to a clip of Lawrence riding on the camel, and we go to a clip of, of Lawrence's uh, boy servant waiting for him, uh, and then we go back to a clip of the guy walking in the hot sun. And uh, I, it just goes on for a long time. And on the one hand, you think, oh. These old movies, they knew how to take their time with a scene. How majestic. On the other hand, you think, is this necessarily a virtue? Um, it is just drawing out this scene for longer than it needs to be drawn out by itself a, a, a virtue? Or could this movie have done with some faster editing so that we could still get the same point but not linger on these scenes for so much. Uh, and once that idea got into my head, that was just all the way throughout this movie uh, where um, I was constantly thinking to myself, would this have been better with a tighter edit? Or is... is Is it in and of itself a virtue that this movie is really taking its time with these scenes? Um, you, you, you do get the impression uh, this movie is one of those old epics that must have cost a fortune to make uh, because it's got all these huge set pieces. And of course, all of this was before CGI. So, you know, when, when there are crossing the desert, that's not a CGI background. They, they are really out there in the desert. Um, and w w when, when they come into all these old Middle East cities, I, you, you know, I, I, I think uh, according to the ending credits, they, they got a number of permissions to film in all these exotic locations, but they, you know, they were actually on location in, in all these spots. So you, you do wonder if the filmmakers will, were kind of like, well, we spent a fortune on this location shot and you are going to see it. You are going to, to um, just revel in the scenery because we actually went out and set this all up and, and by God, it's going to pay off. I, I don't know if that was... Um, some of the, the, the mindset behind this or not. 
Now, the, uh, the scenes with dialogue, when they do get around to talking, are really good. Um, and de delivered by a bunch of classic actors who are, I, I think, giving their A game here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure if I was better versed in classic movies, I'd recognize more of these actors, but I, I recognize enough of them. Peter O'Toole, of course, Omer Sharif, Anthony Quinn, Claude Rains, uh, those, those are the names I recognized at least. Um, and they give, um, oh, and, and of course, Alec Guinness, Alec Guinness. Uh, they give amazing performances. Um, at, Alec Guinness's performance nowadays would be considered a little bit controversial because, or sorry, not his performance maybe, but his casting. He's a British guy who's playing uh, an Arab character. And instead of casting an Arab, they uh, cast Alec Guinness, and I believe they actually brown-faced him a bit. So uh, you can't do that nowadays, uh, but you know, in 1962, uh, and he he does, he does a, a, a great performance as King Faisal. Um, such, they're all they are all really good performances. The, I mean, the, the the scenes of them crossing the desert with no dialogue and the music playing. That tried my patience a little bit, but the scenes, the dialogue scenes, those were perfect. So the, the, the scene when they're in King Faisal's tent and there's King Faisal and there's uh, Lawrence of Arabia and there's Omer Sharif and they're all arguing about strategy. Um, yeah, and, and then Anthony Quinn's character uh, was just played with so much Energy, you, you could tell Anthony Quinn was really loving this role. And then those, those scenes where he was up against Omar Sharif, um, yeah, the, th those were all great. Um, and the history behind this all is interesting. Now, uh, as I was watching this, I, I, I was kind of getting curious, did this really happen? Uh, and I went to the Wikipedia page, um, and uh, it turns out that a lot of things, it looks like, got changed around. I think the timeline, uh, the, the chronology of events maybe would have gotten altered, or the timeline of stuff maybe is pushed forward a little bit. I, I got that impression because the American Reporter... Uh, is talking about how he wants to document uh, Lawrence Arabia because he wants to get his country into the war. But then if you look up at Wikipedia, it looks like a lot of this stuff happened in 1917. So uh, America was already in the war by 1917, right? Um, and then uh, after I watched the movie, I watched um, the History Buffs video on this in which they discuss which parts are historical and which parts are not historical. I'm, I'm sure there's a million videos on YouTube uh, dissecting the history behind this movie, but History Buffs is the channel I was most familiar with. Um, and uh, th th they give an interesting video on it. The impression I got from their video is that the history is actually, the story is correct in the broad strokes, uh, just maybe in some of the characterizations or in some of the little details. Uh, gets things a little bit wrong. Or at the very least, uh, the movie is adhering to T.H. T.E. Lawrence's own um, own version of events. So uh, sometimes even when they're diverging from history, it still may be correct because they're they're going with the version that T.E. Lawrence wrote up in his his book. Um, actually, what what well, I'm thinking about it. Um, another thing that struck me upon rewatching this movie is that uh, the battle scenes are not very good. And, or at, 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 at the least, 
the, the director of this movie was not interested in battle scenes. So in terms of like epic charges, the director is really interested in that. So the camels and horses charging into battle, the raising the, the rifle or the sword above their head, giving the war cry, the epic cavalry charge uh, is filmed a few times in this movie and is really good. And again, you know, a, a, a amazing how they filmed movies in the days before CGI when, when they must have actually, these are not CGI horses they actually did this charge, right? Um, but then once the forces meet up and there's the actual battle, then, then the director is actually not very interested in giving us any intense climactic scenes within the battle. There's, there's uh, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking that first scene when they're taking the guns of, uh, what is it, Aqaba? Uh, and uh, they're charging the Turks, and the Turks are shooting their machine guns. And then the horses are just kind of leaping over these machine gun nests, and the Turks are just falling over without getting hit by anything. Uh, and so, you know, you, you just have to imagine that they're taking out the enemy, even though all it really shows is them riding past the enemy. Um, and and the, the, the few other scenes where there are brief battles um, also m made me think that the director was really not interested in uh, doing one of those big battle scenes where, where you're really seeing like the blow by blow or, uh, of the battle. You, you see the chaos of the battle, you see the charges into the battle, but it, it, it's, it's not a good movie for, uh, you know, a, a, a really thrilling battle itself, which, which again may have been why 14-year-old uh, me was not overly impressed by this movie, that, that, that was the age where teenage boys are primarily watching this kind of stuff for the big action. Um, <clears throat> the characterization of Lawrence of Arabia, uh, I believe can be debated in terms of its historical accuracy. And, and I got that impression by, by watching history buffs. Um, but they, they went with an interesting characterization, which is uh, somebody who was absolutely incredible in terms of the stuff that he could do and he did do, but somebody who was a little bit mad and had a not too subtle messianic complex, which uh, it, he, yeah, the, the movie's not subtle about this at all. Uh, the other characters comment on it. He talks about walking on water. Um, and uh, again, you can see where the, uh, the Dune is, is getting this idea of an outside Messiah coming in to unify the, the desert people um, from the, the Lawrence of Arabia. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I lost my train of thought. What, what was I going to say about this? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, other really interesting thing, which, which didn't kind of hit me until... I was halfway through the movie. There's one part where one of the characters asks him how old he is. Uh, this is the infamous sexual assault scene. And uh, Peter O'Toole, Lawrence of Arabia, says, 27, sir. I thought to myself, 27? Wow, but it's, it's about right, isn't it? Real Lawrence of Arabia was born in 1988. So he would have been 10 in 1998. 20 in 1908, and uh, yeah, 1918. I, I guess the, 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 the last events of this film are happening in 1918, right? So uh, about 30 years old. I, I mean, um, it, amazing. Uh, amazing what some people can accomplish when, when they are so young. Uh, I, I, is it any wonder it all went to his head? Uh, possibly, depending on, on the, the movie's portrayal of it. Um, <clears throat> Peter O'Toole, by the way, is... Uh, 
I've, I've not seen a ton of movies with Peter O'Toole in them, but the, but the movies I have seen, I've always been uh, very impressed by his on-screen charisma. I mean, he, he's another guy who just looks like a movie star. He's, he's got one of those faces that, you know, those really clear, bright blue eyes. He just seems to be like too, too handsome for the real world. Uh, somebody who's only made in the movies. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, what else to say about this? Um, the, 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 the history is really interesting. Um, the, the whole, uh, British and French, uh, actually it's mostly the British. The, the French are only just alluded to, uh, getting into the Middle East, the dissolution of the Turkish Empire, which leads into the Middle East that we know today. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not, obviously it's got a long way to go to get to something recognizable by the end of the film, but, but you can see, you can see where the Arabs are gaining their confidence at, at the end of this film. So, um, yeah. Uh, and as the Middle East is perpetually in the newspapers, I mean, I know it's in the newspapers right now as I'm filming this, but it's in the newspapers every decade. It's, it's an interesting film to kind of see how that all came out. Um, <clears throat> now, the film is, um, as, as Dune picks up on very well, kind of a white savior narrative, maybe. Uh, or, or maybe not. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I, I wonder if this film would get made with the same narrative today. It, it wouldn't, would it? Uh, but uh, I, I, think, I think what... I don't know. Uh, the, the fact that the uh, Arab characters are so good and so strong... Um, redeems the film somewhat. The fact that the, the film itself is, is somewhat encouraging the, the viewer to, to be a little skeptical of Lawrence Arabia and his whole project is a, another thing which re redeems the film a little bit. And uh, of course, it's, it's real history. I mean, it's not, it's changing some stuff, but the, the basic story is all real history. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm going to go ahead and, and finish here. There, of course, there's, there's much more to say on this film, but I think I've, I've largely given my thoughts on it. I was somewhat exhausted by the time it finished, uh, three hours and 47 minutes. Um, but uh, I, at no point did I want to turn it off either. I, I just always wanted to see what was going to happen in the next scene. So um, in, in that respect, it, uh, the film definitely held my attention, even though some individual scenes uh, tried my patience a bit. Uh, yeah, what, what do you think? Uh, how, how does your attention span compare with this film? <laughs>